talked before about the little maps that you go and you find in the malls, you know, and they say, and there's an arrow there, or a spot there says, you are here. We really need to know where we are. And the thing is, is there's a lot of resistance to knowing where we really are, because if we know where we, we really are, I brushed my teeth this morning and I brushed my tongue and I have not been able to control my lips or my tongue since. I've been having a terrible time We really where we really are. I feel like that that uh, Gabby Hayes guy, really, really, where we really are. What would completely change the world at this moment? That's my question to you. And because I can tell by the looks on your faces that you're not going to answer me, I'm going to tell you, if everyone had goodwill, not just imagining that they had goodwill, but if we actually have goodwill, the whole world would be changed, would be different right now. Goodwill isn't high on the list of things that people on earth wish to get. You go and ask people, just go stand at the mall. You know, you are here, stand at the mall with one of those, what are those boards called? Clipboards. The clipboards. Clipboards, yeah, clipboards that people have. And just ask people as they come by, excuse me, uh, ma'am, um, could you tell me the three things that you want to get more than anything else in the world? And I'll bet you that very few people would say goodwill. What do you think? Right. New pair of shoes, a new car, new house, money. money. Very few is pretty generous. <laughs> very few is very generous. But I like to be generous because I can be. And it makes me feel good to be generous. As long as I don't let it get out of hand, and start imagining that other people are generous as well, I find that it's not a harmful thing. Other people find it a little more difficult to be generous because generosity is a characteristic of a certain state of consciousness. And if you don't have that certain state of consciousness, you can't be generous. You know yourself that there are times when you feel very generous and other times when you're paranoid, when you feel clutching and you're into scarcity and you just can't let go of what you have. When I find myself in situations like that, I open up my hands and start giving. I find that that is the time more than any other time to give. When I'm feeling generous, and that's the natural thing, I watch that. But when I'm feeling paranoid and restricted, constricted, that's the time that I try and breathe and open up and let go and get the flow going again. Because contraction is not something that makes for a good flow, it makes for pressure but it doesn't make for a good, easy flow. Good, gentle flow, in and out. Goodwill, why it wouldn't be high on people's list than at the mall, or it's Sunday, it's Sunday morning, go and stand outside of any church in town. And as people come out, ask them, what are the three things that you want to get more than anything else in this world? You still won't find very many people saying, goodwill. Because the most powerful force that we can make in ourselves is lacking. And what do you suppose that most powerful force is that we could make in ourselves? I can tell by the looks on your faces that you don't know, but you're willing to take a shot at it. You want to take a shot at it? Go ahead. External consideration. External consideration. Anyone else? That's it. One thing. Huh? No, I, real will. Real will. Okay. Understanding. There's really very little understanding in life. Now, external consideration will bring understanding. So it's a good answer. Real will, that's big. That's, that's a long way off. That's like, well, I've got this slingshot here, and there's, there's, you know, there's that tin can right out there about 25 feet away on that railing, and I think I, I'm going to take a shot at it. That's external consideration. Real will is, oh, look, I think I can knock the sun out of the sky with this. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's a little big. It's a little long. It's a long shot for the slingshot. You understand what I'm saying? And all we've got now, right now, all we've got is little pitiful slingshots. <laughs> little pitiful slingshots. That's what we've got. You know, we haven't got rocket ships or cannons or big things that can reach the sun. What we've got is little pitiful slingshots. And we can just knock a couple of cans off that railing 25 feet away. We'll be doing pretty well. And if we can get good at that, well, we could probably move the cans another 10 feet out and then practice that for a while. And so that's how I think that we need to approach this work. But you see, that in and of itself, what I've just said, is understanding. You see, I understand how we work. I understand that we've got little pitiful slingshots. 
We, I also understand that we, we don't want little pitiful slingshots. We want high powered rifles with technical scopes and, you know, and that just really aim the computer are aiming and, you know, and, and they measure the, the velocity of the wind and the direction of the wind and they measure this and they measure that and they make all the adjustments automatically. We want a machine to do it for us, in other words. Always. Which is how we got where we are right now. There's very little understanding in life. How can we make understanding in ourselves then? How can we make understanding? You've got a factory. You could make this substance that is so rare, this matter. Understanding is matter. It's a thing. It's a material thing. You can make it inside of yourself. And it's rare. Now, how can we make it? We've got to apply the knowledge and teaching of this work to our present situation, trying to understand why things go as they do. That's how you make understanding. You apply the knowledge of this work. What is this work? This work is the esoteric teachings that have been passed down for thousands and thousands of years that always, at their core, remain the same. And because of the culture and the time and the language that they come in, they appear to be different. But at their core, they are always the same. Apply that knowledge, that teaching, to your present situation, all the time trying to understand why things go as they do. What is the situation? Most of us need to be told. We can't even see what the situation is. Well, what is the situation? Well, I'm sitting here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're sitting here. Why are you sitting here? Sunday? This is this what we do on Sunday? This is what I've done for 20 years? I, why are you asking me that? Why? Is this a trick question? Uh, because I want to be here. Because uh, I... I want to see what you're going to say next. It's going to make my head turn around three times like the exorcist, you know, whatever. We're here, just like the little dot at the map, on the map at the mall. You are here. You are here. But we don't know where here is. You are here. So here we are. Let's take a look at where we are. In this place where we are, we are under 48 orders of laws. We are one step from the lowest level in our universe having 96 orders of laws. We're at the next to the lowest level. You know, you go into these big buildings and there'll be parking level basement. Basement, you know, there's lobby, basement, parking level one, parking level two, parking level three, and that's further and further underground. There's parking level 10, we're at parking level nine. Well, let's look at it that way, that makes it easy. So we're at the next to the lowest place that we can be. We don't like that much. We exist in a world that's far from perfect. Now that we can accept and understand. We look around, we go, yep, that's the truth. It's, it's a world that is far from perfect. We can accept that very easily and we can understand it pretty easily. We may not understand why it's far from perfect, but we do understand that it's far from perfect because, well, look at it. We understand that, but we don't understand why it's not perfect. We don't understand how it got that way. We don't understand what, if anything, we can do about it. What we fail to understand is that we exist here because we can't exist in a better world as we now are. And that's the big rub. This is not an accident. You're not here by accident, waiting for the van to come, the moving van to come to take you to your real home. This is it. This is it because you can't exist anywhere else. Now, why is it that you can't exist on, say, Venus or Mars or Jupiter or Neptune? Why is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. What is our that? Bodies would not be able to. Our bodies wouldn't be able to handle it. We couldn't breathe the atmosphere. Our bodies wouldn't be able to take the temperature changes. Well, why is that? Because that's the way it is. What we are and who we are, we can't exist in another place. We can exist here. And when you think about it, of all the places that we know about in this solar system, this is the only place with such a narrow little spectrum of atmosphere in which we can exist. And even here on this little tiny planet, that we call Earth, and it's a very small planet compared to our solar system, compared to our sun, compared to some of the other planets, but compared to our galaxy, compared to the Milky Way, this is not even visible if you get too far out. This ceases to exist as more than a grain of sand, a speck. But in this little speck upon which we live, there's really a very small part in which we can exist, two-thirds of our speck, we can't live in because it's water and we can't breathe water. Then if we get too far out from our little speck, we can't breathe because the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner and there's less oxygen and we have to have a certain amount of oxygen in order to live. But if we go too far into our speck, it gets hotter and hotter until finally 
We toast. We die because our blood boils, because we have this tiny range, this little sliver temperature range in which we can live. Now, you think about that, it's like, whoa, that's incredible that we can live at all. Yes, and that's how we got here, the second to the lowest place in the universe. Our average level of being, the kind of people that we are, is such that we couldn't possibly exist in a better world. Ooh, now you've gone from preaching to meddling. See, we take exception to that. What do you mean, the kind of people we are? Just what I said, the kind of people we are. And I don't mean just our bodies. I mean the kind of people we are. There are better worlds under fewer laws and a worse world under more laws. <laughs> the more laws, the more imprisoned. That's it. This is how it works. The more laws that we are under, the more imprisoned we are. The fewer laws that we are under, the freer we are. Does this make sense? Look at the army. You go into the army. You start as a recruit. You are the lowest of the low. Anybody can tell you what to do. And you have to do it. Then you become private. And then you can tell recruits what to do. So you are under fewer laws. But they're still under the same amount of laws. So like recruits are world 96. But you become a private, and you're World 48. You, you, I'm under fewer laws. I could tell that guy what to do. <laughs> and then you meet a corporal, and he's under fewer laws, so he can tell you what to do. But then there's a sergeant, and he's under fewer laws, and he can tell the corporal and the private and the recruits what to do. And then you have a lieutenant, and he can tell the sergeant, and he can tell the corporal, and he can tell the private, and he can tell the recruits what to do. Then you have a captain. You got the captain then who can tell the lieutenant what to do, who can tell the sergeant what to do, who can tell the corporal what to do, who can tell the private what to do. And so basically right up to the general and right up to finally somebody like uh, the commander in chief under fewer and fewer laws. But of course we all know that the commander in chief is really under a lot of laws too. In fact, he may actually be under more laws, but he appears to be under fewer laws. But the truth is, is that he may not be at all. But you get the idea. Fewer laws means more freedom. More laws means we're more imprisoned. From our prison, we can't escape very easily by trying to change our world in an external way. Because if we change our world in an external way, we're still under 48 laws, 48 orders of law. So we haven't really become free at all. We've just changed some of the content in our world. The only way to get to a better place in the universe is through self-change. But we constantly miss the point. No, it's not self-change. We have to make people stop killing each other. We have to make people stop polluting the air. We have to make people stop eating junk food. We have to take guns away from them so they can't shoot each other anymore. We have to protect the children. We have to stop people from smoking. We have to cure cancer. We have to stop AIDS. We have to do all this. Then we'll be free. No, no, we miss it. We miss the point. Then we won't be free. We miss the point. And I can prove this beyond the shadow of a doubt. For every invention which heals, we invent something which destroys. You take something that we, you know, we have smallpox under control pretty much on the mm -hmm. planet. Certainly, you, you don't worry about your children getting smallpox. You, 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 know, you concern yourself, oh, they've got chickenpox, but that's no big deal. But smallpox would be a big deal, wouldn't it? Be a huge deal, wouldn't it? But we've got smallpox. We've, we've got a vaccination for that. So the world's a better place, right? Well, yes, except that now cancer is, what's, what's the cancer rate? It's, it's, it's outrageous. How many people are going to get cancer? One in three? One in three people? This is, yeah, that really makes you wince, doesn't it? But smallpox is eradicated for the most part. Polio, think of the past. Bubonic plague, think of the past. I mean, we look at all these things and like the, the scourges of just a couple hundred years ago are wiped out. But now we have got cell phones that are growing tumors in our heads. We don't know why. Now we've got chaos, electronic chaos, fields of electronic chaos that are scrambling our immune systems. And we don't understand why. And we're, we're the things that used to be, the sun used to be, oh, we'd go out in the sun. Oh, isn't it wonderful to be in the sun? We need sunshine. Everything needs sunshine. Now you go out in the sun, you, like, you better have a lot of sunblock on or else it's going to toast you and give you what? Skin cancer. For everything that we fix, something else goes south. We don't see this. We fail to see this contradiction because we fail to see we are under laws. We live in a contained world under a definite number of laws. Earth is a pain factory from which a certain quantity of pain and suffering is demanded. We don't get that. Everything on our planet says that, but we don't get that. We 
somehow are the only kinds of beings on this planet that can take two plus two and get nine or three or twelve or any number that we want. Because everything is the same as everything else, except when it's not. And when is it not? When I don't want it to be. That's the kind of people that we are. And that makes for a crazy reality. A crazy reality that is really no reality whatsoever. So for every invention which heals, we invent something which destroys. I tell you that Earth is a pain factory from which certain quantity, a certain quantity of pain and suffering is demanded. You go, no! People believe that medicine and science will do away with illness. They're having their heads frozen cryogenically because they just believe that science and medicine is going to come up with a cure, then they're going to thaw out their head and cure them. Okay. Actually, a relative cure is found for one thing, and another illness increases. History has proved this for thousands of years. We'll deny it, because we can. Because we can say, no, two plus two is not four. We can do that, and so we will. Won't change anything. So what are the laws? Can you name one of the laws? One of the 48 orders of laws. Can you name one of those laws? The law of accident. The law of accident. Okay, that doesn't mean much to me. Law of gravity. Law of gravity. But I see planes fly, so can you name another law? How about the law of, if you don't eat, you die? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? The law of, you don't eat, you die? How about this one? You don't breathe, you die. How about those two laws? Now, those are serious laws, aren't they? And look at all of the things that those laws make you do. Look at what a prison your life is because of those two laws. Why do you go to work? Because if you don't eat, you'll die. Why do you do a job that you don't want to do? Why do you go do things that you hate for money? Because if you don't eat, you'll die. Why are you not down at the beach? Why are you not walking on the bottom of the ocean exploring down there? Because if you don't breathe, you'll die. And there are a lot of other laws like that, that if you get too deep underwater, under too much pressure, your blood does funky wonky things. And if you come up and you come up without decompressing, you'll die. What about that? What about G-force on your body? What about having all of the all of the blood pushed and the fluids pushed to a certain point in your body and killing you? What about that? You know, those are all laws that we can't do anything about. We're, we're not even talking about the law of gravity and the law of aerodynamics. And those are laws, yes, that's true. But those are orders of laws. But I'm talking about these basic laws. You don't eat, you die. You don't breathe, you die. Those laws matter more, don't they? A lot more. But you notice how far we are from that? Because we imagine that we're free. We imagine that the laws that we have to deal with are gravity and aerodynamics. No, the laws that you have to deal with are eating and breathing, staying alive. We don't think like that. We take it all for granted. Well, yeah, I've got a good job. Everything's fine. Right. These laws belong to this planet. These laws belong to this place. You are here because you can't exist somewhere else. You can't exist where they don't eat. You can't exist where they don't have to breathe. So you have to be here. You are imprisoned here. And the only way to get there is to change you. You're not going to get there by changing the world. Oh, we'll feed everybody on the planet. There'll be an abundance of food for everyone. Not on this planet, there won't, ever. If there's an abundance of food on this planet, I'll tell you who's going to get it. The rats, the bugs, because we aren't going to be able to get it to where it's supposed to be. Why? Because it costs money. Well, but, but we want to feed people. Yeah, we do. But we want to feed ourselves first and more. Because that's what kind of people we are. But there are people who are doing things. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I used to share my lunch once in a while, too. And there's something I didn't really like. Wake up. Oh, wait. That's what all esoteric teaching always says. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. And look at what is going on here. The reality of it, the truth of it, as it is. Not as we would like it to be. Not as we imagine it would be. Not as it should be. Not as it could be, but as it is. We imagine we're free to do as we please. That we can do. That we can alter everything in our favor. We're under the illusion that we're progressing. That the passage of time means we get better. This is a fact of life. These things are counterproductive. These things keep us from realizing you are here. You are here because you can't be anywhere else. Well, I could be if I wanted to be. No, you couldn't. Any more than you can not eat because you don't want to eat and live. Any more than you can not breathe and live because you said so. 
From now on, I'm the kind of being that doesn't have to breathe in order to live. Oh, so you're a dead being. So that means you're a not being. Because on this planet, where we are, that's one of the laws. And that's it. We're imprisoned here. You're not going to change that. We see war and illness as the exceptions rather than the rule belonging to our level of being. But you see, our level of being has a rule that we crack each other's skulls open, that we steal from each other, that we murder each other, that we don't understand each other, that we don't agree with each other, and that we don't try to understand each other. We try to force each other. That's the law of our level of being. If you want that to change, you've got to change your level of being. Because that law is the law of our level of being, just like eating and breathing. Now, if you can see that you could change the law of the level of your being so that you didn't crack other people's skulls when they didn't agree with you. And you, you say, that's, that's, that's believable, isn't it? I could get there. I might be able to get there if I work really hard. I, I think I could get there. I don't beat my wife anymore. I don't kick my dog anymore. I, I haven't strangled one of my children this month. Well, good. That's progress. So you can see that you can raise your level of being. You can be less of a caveman. You can get out of the Jurassic period of your head and of your emotions and get into a, a more evolved place where you have something that you make inside of yourself that makes this possible. And that's called understanding. Understanding is the key here. This force, this thing that you can make in yourself, understanding, can set you free from this prison. That's what I'm talking about. To escape, we must cease to see changing external conditions as the final solution and begin changing ourselves. Look, I want to change the world too. I want people who are suffering from AIDS to be healed. I want little children who have distended bellies from not eating properly and who have the flies crawling in their eyes to get a drink and who have sores all over their bodies. You know, I want those people to be fed too. But that's not going to happen overnight. And it never has, and it never will. And if you eradicate it here, it'll come out over here. And if you eradicate it there, it'll pop up like a sore, like a boil, like a festering thing over here on the planet. Why? Because that is the way this planet is. A certain amount of pain and suffering is demanded of this planet, and we will pay because we are under law. And that law creates pain and suffering. And if you don't see that, you don't have enough understanding. You need to have some more understanding because understanding will help you to see that. Our relationship to our world must change by beginning to observe ourselves and our world and working on our mechanical reactions to our world. Rather than reacting to everything in the world mechanically, we need to start to see ourselves where we are. You are here. You are here in this world. You are under this many orders of laws, 48 orders of laws. This is the fact about it. It's the way it is. Now, start to relate to your world with that new understanding. Instead of trying to change your world, start to change yourself. If a man remains mechanical, he remains in prison. If he begins to try to awaken, he begins to pass under fewer laws. Period. This is the bottom line of esoteric teachings. If you remain mechanical, if you stay asleep, you are under the same amount of laws. But if you begin to awaken, you are under fewer laws. Let's take it in a very base way. If you're asleep on your bed, people can do things to you and there's nothing you can do about it. When people put you to sleep in a surgery with anesthesia, they do all, they can kill you. There's nothing you can do about it. Isn't that true? And once they put the moving center out, you're, you're done. You're just lying there. They can actually just put a part of your body to sleep while you're awake watching them do it. They call that a local anesthesia. I and mean, they have names for this stuff, but we don't know that. We don't, we don't think about it. Oh, yeah, but that doesn't mean anything. Yes, it does mean something. It means a lot. And if we study these things, we can understand things. And understanding is what can set us free from some laws. And the more we understand, the more free we can become. So understanding is important. Coming under fewer laws is coming under better influences. Waking up from a state of sleep where we're functions of life, serving nature with no inner hope, no inner stability, no inner peace of mind. Look at the law of the jungle. Why do you not live in the jungle? Well, I don't like to be eaten by tigers. I hate it when elephants sit on me. I think it's just awful when boa constrictors make me lunch. 
squeeze me to death and then make me lunch. I don't mean like make me lunch. I mean make lunch of me. I hate that. So I moved out of the jungle. And not only that, but all the bugs kept biting me. Everything wanted to eat me. So I moved out of there and I built this fort. Yeah, this fort I call my house. And I kept the animals out. You know, and I put up a fence to keep the animals out. And I did this, and I put up lights to keep the animals away. And then I did this, and I, you, you start to see, I start to become aware. I said, I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to be under fewer laws. I'm not under the law of the jungle anymore. Oh, yeah, well, try driving on the freeway. Well, that's a different matter. That's the law of the asphalt jungle. That's the law of the concrete jungle. That's the law of the twisted metal jungle. And that's a different law? No. No, it's the same law. And it's just as crazy out there. So you're out in the you're out in Africa and the jungle, and, the, and the, you know you got lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and cheetahs and jaguars and and all these things and elephants and antelopes and impalas and and you go out on the freeway and you got the same thing as far as I can tell. They even have the same names, and it's just as dangerous, maybe even more dangerous. My guess is more people are killed by cars than are killed by alligators or lions, or tigers, and bears. What do you think? Yeah. So what have we changed? What have we fixed? Our relationship to our world has to change. The work, the gospels, esoteric teachings, they all seek to awaken man out of his state of sleep that we're in. Interchange, inner development, inner transformation is possible if we'll work on ourselves in the right way. In the right way. Oh, why does he always have to say that? Because there is a right way. There's a way that works. There's a right way for a clock, for the hands of a clock to go. It's called clockwise. And then we have anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. That's the wrong way for a clock. The right way for a clock is clockwise, from left to right, around the circle, from left to right. That's the right way. Why? Because that's the way we tell time. That's how we've set it up. These esoteric teachings are much the same. There is a right way. You can find that right way. Now, a lot of people won't find the right way. They'll spend their entire lives trying to do it the wrong way, just because nobody's going to tell them what to do. Great. Have at it. Catch you on another life, I guess. The thing is, is that it's quite definite, and you can become aware of it once you begin to touch it. What? The right way. It is quite definite. You can feel it inside of you, the same way you can feel your ribs. Well, I think most of you can feel your ribs under the skin, where you can feel your cheekbones. Well, you can't see all of that stuff, but you can feel it, can't you? Okay, you can feel the bones in your fingers, can't you? So you can feel things inside of you that you can't necessarily see, and you can begin to understand that they're there. So you can definitely become aware of this as you begin to touch it. Only then will you generate the force needed to do what you don't want to do. Because what we do is usually mechanical. What we don't want to do, those are the things that we have trouble with. We don't have trouble doing what we want to do. We have trouble doing what we don't want to do. But what we found is that we want to do, what we want to do is the same thing we've always done. Well, that hasn't got us free, has it? So now somebody comes along and they say, well, you can't do that to get free. You've got to do this. Well, I don't want to do that. Right. But do you want to be free? Well, yes, I want to be free, but I don't want to do that. Now what you need is the force to do what you don't want to do so that you can get what you say you want, which is to be free. And that's the rub on all this. Make right effort. Become responsible for your daily actions, your inner thoughts, what you say secretly. Ooh, what you say secretly. What does that mean? What that means is what you say secretly to yourself about people, that. Start to become responsible for that instead of just allowing that to go on. You, notice, have you ever notice how you just allow that to go on, how you entertain that in your mind, how you just let it be? Well, that's okay. I'm not saying it. I'm not, I'm not expressing negative emotions. Yes, you are. If you're allowing it to go on, you're expressing negative emotions. You're just expressing them secretly. Well, but nobody can see it. Right, so your pride and vanity stay intact? Is that what you're telling me? Congratulations. That's an accomplishment. As we begin to observe these things, the illusion of our goodwill begins to evaporate. You remember the goodwill that we all think we have? <laughs> 
We see the immense task it is to free ourselves from these evil places in our minds and in our feelings. And if you don't know that you have evil places in your mind and in your feelings, then you haven't been observing yourself. Because the things that go on in your mind, if they went on in the world, you would be imprisoned. The things that go on in your feelings, if they went on in the world, you would be in prison. Actually, the things that go on in your mind and the things that go on in your feelings do go on in the world, and we call them heinous crimes. But we make ourselves better than the people who are doing them by saying we don't do them, we just think about them. And then we lie about that and say we don't even really think about it. But what I'm saying is become responsible for those things, start to see those things, and start to deal with those things there. Then we begin to understand what this work is about. Then we see how impossible it is for humanity as a whole to change when we begin to see how difficult it is for us ourselves to change in this way. Well, it's a pretty dismal, bleak outlook when you think about it. Unless you realize that you can work. We can work. I can work. I can work right here in this evil part of my mind. I can work right here in this wicked part of my feelings. I can start to work right here and I can start to cast this stuff out of me. I can st start to diminish those thoughts. I can stop entertaining them. I can start to diminish those feelings by not expressing them, by understanding, by creating in myself through external consideration, that's one way, understanding. Understanding about other people. Understanding about this world and being under 48 orders of laws. Understanding about the prison that I'm in and how to get out of it. And as I begin to understand those things and apply my understanding, I find that I'm under fewer laws. I've raised my level of being. That's what this work is about, if we're willing to do it.